During the next several messages, we are not only going to explore Israel's past, present, and future, but we will also get a good look at the landscape, people, climate, and geography of this fascinating land. Before we get started on the messages, though, we want to give you a brief flyover of the land of Israel to help you get better acquainted with the locations of some of the places we will visit in these messages. We will start in the modern city of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is located on the shores of the Mediterranean and represents the new and modern state of Israel. Tel Aviv was founded 100 years ago on the outskirts of the biblical city of Joppa. Tel Aviv is the business and technology hub of the country and is the 17th most expensive city in the world to live in. There are about 400,000 residents. Tel Aviv is located almost exactly in the middle of Israel's Mediterranean coastline. As we pull back from Tel Aviv, we can see the areas that we hear about most often in the Western media, and that is Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. These areas are occupied by Palestinians, but are currently under the control of the Israelis. They are often referred to as occupied lands. The world does not recognize Israel's rights to this land, and we know that these disputes will not be settled until the Lord Jesus Christ comes to bring lasting peace. Until that time, we know that much blood is yet to be shed in Israel. We will now move in to see Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel, and Mount Carmel. The Valley of Jezreel has also been historically known as the Valley of Ezraelon and will one day be known as the Valley of Armageddon. Armageddon means Hill of Megiddo. The valley is 25 miles long and 14 miles wide, surrounded by Mount Carmel. Mount Megiddo. Mount Gilboa. Mount Mora. and Mount Tabor. The brook Kishon runs through the middle of this valley. As we move from the Valley of Jezreel en route to the Sea of Galilee, we pass over the top of Mount Tabor, the location of Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. One of the unique things about Israel is the use of the communal farming community known as the Kibbutz. The first kibbutz was founded about 100 years ago as a way for Israelis to combine forces to create farms in the desert. Today, there are about 250 kibbutzim in Israel with more than 100,000 residents. All the property in the kibbutz is owned by the community. As you can see from the kibbutz below, they are often formed in circles with the common areas like schools, housing and dining halls in the center and the farms radiating out from the middle. We are now at the Sea of Galilee, which has also been known as the Lake of Gennesaret and the Sea of Tiberias. The ancient city of Tiberias, located here, was built by Herod the Great and was a thriving city in Jesus' day. Moving up the coastline, we passed the city of Capernaum, where many biblical events took place. It was here that the lame man was let down through the roof to be healed by Jesus. Traveling further north, we come to the ancient ruins of the city of Chorazin, where Jesus pronounced woeful curses upon the inhabitants for their unbelief. North of the Sea of Galilee is Mount Hermon. At the base of Mount Hermon was the city of Caesarea Philippi. It was here that Jesus told his disciples that he would build his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. It is possible that Mount Hermon, at more than 9,000 feet tall, was the site of Jesus' transfiguration. Moving back south, we see the area of the Golan Heights, which is controlled by Israel. The area outlined in orange is a no-man's land between Israel and Syria. The road to Damascus passes through this area. We will follow the Jordan River all the way down to Jerusalem. As you can see, Jerusalem is the dividing line between the green areas toward the coast and the desert areas toward the Dead Sea. In Jerusalem, we move in to see the Temple Mount with the Dome of the Rock on top. Across the Kidron Valley is the Mount of Olives, and at the base of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. As we come back around the Temple Mount, we can see the site of the Western Wall. In the center of the Old City is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which we will discuss in these presentations. 
Moving directly west, we pass near Jericho as we come to the site of Qumran on the Dead Sea. Qumran is the site where hundreds of scrolls were discovered in the late 1940s. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on Earth, about one quarter mile below sea level. As there is no outlet from the Dead Sea, waters flow in and then evaporate, leaving whatever salts and chemicals they brought with them. Rising up from the Dead Sea, we can survey the Judean wilderness and see that it is exactly that, a dry and barren desert where only Bedouin shepherds live. Just across the Jordanian line, we catch sight of Mount Nebo, where Moses surveyed all of the Promised Land. The scripture said that Moses was able to see all the land, even as far north as Dan. Dan is located at the northernmost point near Mount Hermon. Moses was able to see all the way north and to the sea from here. Back to the coastline, we come to the southernmost point on the coast, the Gaza Strip. South of the Gaza Strip is the very inhospitable Negev Desert, which comprises more than 55% of Israel's landmass. The land of Israel and the people of Israel are full of contradictions. The land contains beautiful farmlands and fertile fields, almost side by side with the blasting heat and barren wilderness of the desert. And the history of the people of Israel has also been filled with contrasts. We think of Moses atop Mount Sinai in communion with God, and Aaron below presiding over the worship of an idol. Israel is the land of the Bible, the land of the Savior, and the land of prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Let us now turn our attention to Israel, past, present, and future. All right, that gives a bit of introduction to the land, the geography. But a visit to Israel, you're very impressed by the ancient culture, even though the newest part of the Bible was written 2,000 years ago, you can still learn a lot about the ancient Bible culture on a visit to Israel these days. And so we want to look for a few minutes at cultural things that you see in Israel. The ancient scrolls are still there. The Old Testament scriptures were not written uh, bound in books as we have today. They were written on scrolls animal, made of animal skins. And in, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, would have required uh, about 150 feet of those animal skins. So ordinarily, you, didn't have, you had uh, uh, scrolls containing one book of the Bible because they were so large. But you can still see the scrolls in Israel today. This is a scroll of Psalms that uh, was located in a room near the Wailing Wall that is used by the Jews as they pray there today. If you go to the Israel Museum, you see an ancient scroll of the book of Isaiah was found in one of the Dead Sea caves. The entire scroll was found almost intact, and it's nearly 25 feet long, that one scroll of Isaiah. You can see the phylacteries, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 8, God required that they write the scripture on their forehead. But the Jews have uh, made a big show of that. And just as in the days of Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, said of the Pharisees that they had enlarged their phylacteries. And they're still very large today. You can go to the Wailing Wall, for example, and see the, the large phylactery on their forehead. And those contain tiny portions of scripture. Here's an ancient phylactery, a leather phylactery that's open. And you can see the four tiny little scrolls inside of the phylactery. And God also required that they write the scripture on the doorpost of their houses. And today these are little boxes called mezuzahs. And they also contain tiny portions of scripture. You can see robes on both Jews and Muslims today in Jerusalem and in Israel. Clothing, much as it was in ancient times. God also required that they put fringes on the four quarters of their garments in uh, Deuteronomy 22, 12. And the ultra-Orthodox Jews still have those fringes hanging down from their garments. You can see camels today in Israel. 
And uh, camels are mentioned, of course, many times in the Bible. And they were used for milk, for meat, and for transportation. The particular kind of camels they have there are very large. They're about seven feet tall at the hump. They can run 40 miles an hour uh, for some distances. And they are designed for uh, life in arid places. The camel can drink 26 to 40 gallons of water at a time and really store up the water. They don't even begin to sweat until uh, the temperature rises to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's many ways that the camel is designed for a desert condition. You can see the carob. The carob is used to make a chocolate substitute, but the seed uh, was used as a measure of weight. The weight of a gira, which is mentioned in the Bible, which is a 20th part of a shekel, which is a 50th part of a mina, which is a 60th part of a tylant. Measure of weight. Olives, mentioned many times in the Bible. You can see the olive trees today in Israel. The ancient olive presses. This press was in Capernaum. And they crushed the olive and the olive pit. The pit also contains oil to extract the oil from the olives. And uh, it's still a big part of the economy today there in Israel and all across the Middle East. But Jesus, before he went uh, to the crucifixion on the Mount of Olives, the Bible says he sweat great drops of blood and he was suffering there alone in preparation for the, the crucifixion. And uh, a place called Gethsemane, which means olive press. There are still ancient olive trees on the Mount of Olives dating back more than 2,000 years old before the time of Christ. You can see mangers in Israel. A manger was simply a container for grain for cattle. And uh, these ancient mangers are located in Megiddo, probably belong to Solomon and his stables there. But the you can also see in these mangers the measure of the ephah, which is mentioned in the Bible often. And uh, that feed trough contained an ephah of grain. You can see how large it was there. The millstones. One of the places where the millstones was produced was Capernaum. It was there that Jesus warned and he said that if you offend one of these little ones, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. These millstones are very large and heavy. They're about two feet tall, made out of volcanic rock, and uh, produced there in Capernaum. were conical shaped, and uh, the top part fit down into the bottom part, and they turned to grind the wheat. The battlements. God's law required that they the Jews put battlements around the tops of the roofs so that someone would not accidentally fall off. They were required to do that. They were responsible for their neighbors and the safety of their neighbors. The mustard seed. Jesus talked about the mustard seed. He likened it to the New Testament church and the simplicity of the New Testament church. And he also likened it to faith. We saw a mustard plant on in, in Nazareth, on the brow of Nazareth, where they tried to throw Jesus off the brow and kill him. And the tiny seeds of the mustard seed. And Jesus talked about the coins, uh, Caesar's coin. He said, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And here is a coin bearing the image of Tiberius Caesar, who was the Caesar of that day. The lamps, and Jesus in the parable of the virgin talked about the lamps. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. And that uh, the Herodian lamp was a common lamp of that day, it was uh, operated with olive oil, had a wick down inside of it. 
And then the fishing with the nets. You can still see that demonstrated today on the Sea of Galilee. The type of fishing that the disciples did, Peter and John. And there's an ancient boat that's been recovered from the time of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. It was about uh, 27 feet long, 7 feet wide, and would uh, accommodate about 14 men. But it had a mast, it was a sailing vessel, it had oars. And then the ancient tombs carved into the rock, the type of tomb in which Jesus was laid after he was crucified. This tomb is located in northern Israel. They were uh, expanding a road and they discovered this ancient tomb with, its, with the stone that they used to roll across and seal the tomb. And you can see a lot of evidence of the Roman Empire. The Rome ruled Israel for many centuries, starting before the time of Christ. And you can see the greatness, uh, some evidence of the greatness of the Roman Empire, the magnificence of its architecture and its buildings, the ancient aqueducts that brought water into the cities to, to, for their fountains, for their baths. They had running water in the cities beautiful tiles and mosaics that they used to decorate the cities, the ancient agoras, the uh, marketplaces, and the wide boulevards. Oftentimes they would light these at night with torches and lanterns, and the old uh, chariot uh, racing facilities, the stadiums, the baths. They had hot, cold, warm water in the baths, very elaborate uh, plumbing systems, ancient uh, theaters where they would uh, not only entertain the people and put on uh, various kind of plays and things, but also gladiator fights, putting to death Christians and Jews. Some of the theaters could be flooded and they would have mock naval battles down in the bottom of the theaters. In this particular theater at Caesarea Maritima, they slaughtered 2,500 Jews in uh, celebrating Titus' victory over Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The ancient stadiums, also called hippodromes or circuses, where they had chariot races and various sporting activities. This is the stadium at Caesarea Maritima, the one at Beth Shan in northern Israel, and the ancient gods and goddesses of Rome. Jupiter was one of the chief gods. He was also called Zeus. Artemis, many goddesses. And the mother goddesses that came down from Babel and was adopted by all of the pagan nations. The mother goddesses such as Tiki. But this is where Rome borrowed her doctrine of uh, the Madonna, and the little baby Jesus, which is still a prominent doctrine of Rome, of course, today. And so you can learn a lot about Bible culture and ancient culture on a visit to Israel. But this morning, we want to look at one other thing a little bit more closely. We've already had an introduction to that, but that is the land, the geography. To me, the visit to Israel earlier this year, I guess the most striking thing to me was how it opens up the Bible's geography uh, to you and how that the Bible is just uh, different after a visit to Israel. I highly recommend a visit to Israel. But we're going to start in the north Sea of Galilee. And... This is where, of course, Jesus spent a lot of his time. And uh, Freshwater Lake, not very large, 13 miles long by about 7 miles wide. And uh, the River Jordan coming in from the north, feeding the lake, and then flowing out of the south down to the Dead Sea. The fish, there's a fish there called St. Peter's fish, but it's a tilapia. 
Today, the tourists, of course, eat fish by the Sea of Galilee. It's the thing to do. But those fish are not caught in the Sea of Galilee. They are farm-raised. In fact, earlier this year, the, the government of Israel put a two-year ban on fishing because the lake is so overfished. But Jesus spent much of his life in this part of Israel. Cana and Nazareth are just a few miles from the lake. It was in Nazareth that Jesus' own people tried to kill him, to cast him off at the brow, the very steep brow of Nazareth. And he eluded them at that time. At Cana, where Jesus performed his first miracle, turning the water into wine. It's here that Jesus began to preach and to to demand that the people repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It was here that he called the fishermen to be his apostles, Peter and Andrew, James and John, who were fishermen on that lake. It was here that Jesus calmed the storm. It was here that he walked on the water. It was here that he fed the multitudes twice, preached the parables. It was here on the eastern side of that lake that Jesus cast the demons out of the demoniac and they entered the swine and ran down the steep slope there and drowned in the sea. That's the only place on the lake that has a steep slope running right down into the sea. And in the northern part of the, the uh, Sea of Galilee is Chorazin and Capernaum and Bethsaida, here where Jesus did many mighty miracles and proved without a doubt that he was the promised Messiah, and yet he was rejected and they did not believe, and, and Jesus turned and he, he, he gave a, a, a terrible condemnation of them, and he said, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Thou which art exalted unto heaven shall be brought down to hell. Today, that's a desolate place. Chorazim is a waste. All the buildings are falling down. It's just a ruin. It's a beautiful spot overlooking the sea, and yet it's never been rebuilt. Coming south, we come to Beth Shen, which is an ancient city. It was a uh, a, a Philistine city that was finally conquered by Solomon. But it became a, a very famous Roman city, a very influential Roman city. And they've done extensive excavations there. King Saul and his sons were killed nearby in battle, the hands of the Philistines, on Mount Geboa. And they took Saul's body cut his head off, and uh, nailed his body to the wall of the city, which at that time was located up on a hill. And they put his head in the temple of one of their gods. But the men of Jabesh Gilead came with great bravery, and they, they recovered the body of Saul at night. Bethshan was a very important Roman city, it had magnificent theater that could seat 4,000 for the entertainment of the people and uh, a large stadium for sporting events, chariot races, impressive buildings, colonnaded buildings and boulevards, running water, bathhouses, as we've already mentioned, that had an elaborate plumbing system, hot, cold, and warm water heated with furnaces, multi-seat public toilets. Don't ask me how these worked. I don't know. We come to the Valley of Jezreel, the place I most wanted to see, even more than Jerusalem, because this pertains so much to the future Bible prophecy. The Valley of Jezreel is in the north of Israel, large, broad, long valley. And it's a strategic place because any army marching north to south or south to north had to pass through this valley as the mountains are on both sides. 
And it's been said that more battles have been fought here than any other place on earth. And yet the greatest battle lies in the future. The battle called in the Bible Armageddon, which is from the, from the Greek Armageddon, the hill of Megiddo. And that hill is there today. It's been extensively excavated, archaeological excavations. It was here in this valley that Deborah and Barak defeated the Canaanites in about 1300 B.C. It was here that Gideon defeated the Midianites in about 1250 B.C. It was here that King Saul was killed in battle against the Philistines. It was here that Solomon built one of his great cities, fortress cities, and the, and the palace and, and uh, places for his horses and chariots. It was here that King Isaiah was killed at the hands of Jehu. It was here that King Josiah was killed at the hands of the king of Egypt. He went out against Egypt. But many battles have been fought since biblical times. The Knights of the Templars, the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Knights, and the Crusaders had a uh, uh, castle nearby there, and they were defeated by the Muslim armies under the leadership of Saladin in the 12th century. Here in that place, Napoleon Bonaparte, at the head of 2,000 troops, rooted an army of Turks of 25,000 here in that place, Megiddo. Lord Allenby, the head of the British forces, 1918, routed the Turks again in that same place and made the way for the defeat of the, the, the Muslim control of that country and for the British to come in and control the country, which lasted until after World War II. Mount Carmel overlooks the Valley of Jezreel. And this is where Elijah defeated the, the Baal prophets, Mount Carmel. Caesarea Maritima, if we come farther south on the coast, beautiful ancient city, as we've already mentioned, right on the Mediterranean, one of the jewels of the Roman Empire. The Mediterranean there is very beautiful. It's almost green colored the day we were there. But it was a beautiful, impressive city, Roman city, built in honor of their Caesars and their gods. The construction of the harbor was an engineering marvel of the day. And this is not to be confused with Caesarea Philippi, which is up north at the base of Mount Hermon. But this place is mentioned often in the book of Acts. It's here that Peter baptized Cornelius. The Roman 10th Legion was headquartered here, and Cornelius, of course, was a centurion. He was over 100 soldiers. He got saved. He was baptized. It was here that Paul was imprisoned and appeared before Felix and Festus and Agrippa, was the home of Philip the Evangelist, was here that King Herod Agrippa was eaten by worms in this very stadium because he did not give the glory to God, and they said, oh, he's a God, and, but God killed him that day. We come further south to Samaria, Samaria was conquered by the Assyrians, the northern tribes of Israel, and populated by pagan people. The Assyrians brought pagans in and repopulated the place. And so it created a religion that was partly Jewish and partly pagan. It still exists today in Samaria. They, their holy mountain is Gerizim which is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. It was where they read the law, the curses and the blessings, the two mountains there. And this is the mountain that the woman at the well in John 4 was talking about, our father's worship in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, not Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. But the Samaritans still offer blood sacrifices. They have a corruption of the Passover that they keep every year. Each family slaughters a lamb, has the blood there. 
which is more than the Jews do. The Jews don't have any blood anymore, no sacrifices. They still keep the Passover, but there's no blood, there's no lamb. They still keep Yom Kippur, no blood, no lamb, uh, uh, the Day of Atonement. No lamb. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The Jews have no lamb. They rejected the Lamb of God who came to die for our sins. We come farther south to the Judean wilderness, which is below Jerusalem. And it certainly is a wilderness today. Very desolate. This is where David hid from Saul. It's where John the Baptist pr probably preached. It's where Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days. And then we come to Bethlehem, just a few miles from Jerusalem, where Jesus was born. It's under Palestinian control today. Tourist movement is, is, is tightly controlled. But we did see the Church of the Annunciation, Roman Catholic Church, where they say that Jesus' manger is located. Roman Catholics are worshiping at that site. And then we come to Jerusalem, future capital of the world. But Jerusalem is mentioned nearly a thousand times in the Bible. It's the most important city in the world, by far. No structures are left standing today from the time of Jesus. That city has been destroyed and raised many times since then. But you still get a feel of what it was like. And there's a model, a very impressive $2 million model of the ancient city, which is located at the Israel Museum today. You can see what the ancient city looked like. But it has a very ancient feel to it even today. In the old city of Jerusalem, the bazaars, the marketplaces, the clothing, the different languages, the different religions, the mingling of the people from different parts of the world. There. But we, the, the most prominent structure in Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. And it's occupied today by the Muslims. The Dome of the Rock sits on top, Muslim mosque. The Jews are not allowed to pray on the Temple Mount, even today. The nearest they can get to, to the ancient temple to pray is, is the Western Wall, called the Wailing Wall, where they pray. Every day you can see the Jews there praying. But you can see ancient stones that go back to the time of Jesus in the walls, the temple walls there. But the, the mound is occupied by the Muslims. There's two, two mosques there, the most prominent one being the Dome of the Rock. But this is where the ancient temple of the Jewish temple sat, right there, probably in that same spot. First, the Temple of Solomon, and then the temple, the second temple that was built under direction of Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. To the east of the Temple Mount, the Kidron Valley. And then, at farther east, is the Mount of Olives. As you go up the Kidron Valley, you see the, the ruins of the Tower of Siloam. Jesus said that 15, 18, people, 18 people were killed when the tower fell in his day. You can see the ancient city of David south of the Temple Mount, over on the left side of the screen. The Kidron Valley running up beside it. The Valley of Hinnom. They burned the garbage here in Jesus' day. Before that, the idolatrous Jews had sacrificed their own children to pagan gods there, to Moloch. In Jesus' day, they burned garbage there. Jesus likened that place to hell. The Greek word is Gienna, Valley of Hinnom. And Jesus likened those fires to the fires of hell. Jesus often preached about hell, warned about hell. And then the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley. The ancient olive trees are there. This is where Jesus prayed before they came to arrest him. Many of the trees, some of the trees are over 2,000 years old, they say, there. 
And finally, Gordon's Calvary. The traditional place where Jesus was crucified and buried is located by, is occupied today by a Roman Catholic Greek Orthodox church called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But Gordon was a British officer and he found this cliff farther away from the city in the, in the 19th century and it, and it looked like the face of a skull. That's what Golgotha means. And so he, he believed that it was the place where Jesus was crucified. And nearby, nearby is a tomb, which is frequently visited and photographed today. It's an ancient burial tomb. And this is where the, the Baptists and Evangelicals usually go. Uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is so paganized, so idolatrous today. I don't think Jesus was buried here in this tomb. But it doesn't matter where he was buried. Because the tomb is empty. One of the, most, one of the best attested facts of ancient history is the fact that that tomb was empty. And that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Tested. Not blind faith, a fact of history. And so Israel is a fascinating place for the Bible believer. And we're going to look a lot in this conference at Bible prophecy and how it relates to the present and the future condition of Israel. God bless you. Pastor.